Good morning, Boulevard, and uh, whoever is uh, watching there on live stream, we are glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, you know, um, probably like you, this is my, my uh, favorite way uh, to communicate uh, to the church, uh, to our family, but I was reminded this week that um, we have an opportunity that we have not had years ago, just a few years ago, uh, through live stream and through Facebook Live to continue to connect with you all and be able to communicate, and, and I will tell you that for, for that I am, I am thankful. Uh, hey, we are in uh, towards the end of a series we are calling Face to Face. Uh, it is uh, from John's Gospel. It's John uh, helping us to look God in the eye, to look Jesus in the eye, and to see him as he really is. And it's not lost on me, the irony as we uh, close out this face-to-face -face series, that we have not actually been able to be face-to-face -face, uh, for several weeks, all right? And uh, we hope that that will change. We hope that will change very, very soon. Last week, Jim did a splendid job of talking with us from John 15 about remaining in him and, and what that means, what it takes for us to remain in Christ. And we turn to chapter 16 and 17, and primarily what you see in chapter 16 and 17 is this. Uh, you see Jesus speaking with his friends on a very, very deep heart-to-heart -heart level in chapter 16, uh, just talking with them, basically kind of doing some some pep talk and some prep talk, prep about what is getting ready to take place. And then in chapter 17, he turns to his father, and he has an incredibly intense, intimate conversation with his father about, about him being sent and then what the future looks like. And, and uh, it's some, some, beautiful, uh, some beautiful words, both between Jesus and his friends, the apostles, and Jesus and the father. Uh, Jesus in chapter 18, uh, there's a lot more action uh, after the pep and prep of 16 and 17. In John 18, there's just all this action, a lot of drama. Most of it is not good. There are a lot of things that we can do in our lives that create disappointment, incidents that can cause us to feel badly about ourselves, uh, we can uh, we we cannot keep a promise. Maybe uh, we we can not come through in some way. Not be there when we're supposed to be there. We can forget something that is important to us. Maybe someone's birthday. Those kind of things. But but I will tell you that that the incident in your and I's life that reminds us that we are not who we believed ourselves to be may be at the top of that list. Nothing maybe bothers us more than recognizing by crossing some type of line that we are not who we believed ourselves to be. It is a tough day. It's a tough day when we realize that we are not who we have believed ourselves to be. John 18 starts this way after a conversation with his friends and a conversation with the father. Jesus gathers his friends together and he heads across uh, to the Kidron, across the Kidron Valley to this olive grove. The Kidron Valley was a, was a valley that is northeast of the old Jerusalem wall. And he, he takes them to this place and John says that, that later on that this was a place that they had gathered often. It's the reason that Judas knew probably where Jesus would be at that time. And if they're in the Kidron Valley, a couple things happen. John tells us that there, as they were gathered, that Judas, Judas comes, and he comes with this contingent of Roman soldiers. And they come, and, and he has a sign for them, and they find out who Jesus is. They're looking for Jesus. He says, I'm the one. John records a couple things that are just real interesting. One is the fact that when Jesus says to the contingent of soldiers, I am he, it says they literally all fall back and fall down. Would have loved to have been there to see that moment. He records something else. They're right there in the middle of it when the heat's kind of rising and, and there's some, a lot of tension there that Peter, one of Jesus' apostles and best friends, draws a sword out of the sheath and cuts the ear off one of the servants named Malchus. At that point in time, the guards grab Jesus, and they take him 
they take him back across the Kidron Valley and they take him to Annas, who is the high priest at that time. John records or that one of the apostles is able to go into the inner courtyard, but Peter has to stay out at that time. And then later on, he records in John 18, 16 through 17, that it says Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she lets Peter in. The woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Inside, Jesus is being asked questions by the high priest, Annas. Outside, there's conversation going. And John records, because it's our cold night, that, that once Peter is inside the inner courtyard, that the fire is started because it's a cold night. And they're outside, and they're, they're, they're all hovered around the campfire, warming themselves. Peter is standing with them. It says in verse, verse 25, Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the war, fire warming himself, they asked him again, You're not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, no, I am not. Time for the third question. Uh, this, time, this time, the little incident in the olive grove is going uh, is is to be a painful, more painful for Peter this time. In verse 26, but one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Now, now we've gone from the supposition, are you one of his followers? In the first two questions to an actual eyewitness of something that Peter has done while he is actually in the presence of Jesus. And John records in the 27th verse of the 18th chapter, again, Peter denied it and immediately a rooster crowed. You think Peter was stunned? Are, are, are we stunned? If you've never read that passage before, it's not what you're expecting. You're expecting finally after once or twice, you're expecting him to, to rise up and go, oh, no more, no more. This time, this time, I'm speaking for Jesus. This time, I am proclaiming that I am a follower. If you've never read the passage before, you've got to be stunned. Even if you've read it before, we, we, we keep hoping that there's another ending other than the one we find. Him saying for the third time, I am not, and immediately the rooster crows. Three times, folks. Three times. I mean, this is, this is a man who is a, a follower of Jesus. This is one of the ones that, that one of the 12 that, that Jesus has, has picked, has chosen specifically, who will carry on the message of the kingdom, who will spread the good news around the world. This is not only one of the 12, this is one of the three or four who are one of the, the primary leaders, the, the inner circle that Jesus has. It's amazing, isn't it? When put under pressure, Peter denies him three different times. If you look back just a couple chapters, you're going to find that in Jesus' conversation with them, as he prepares them for what is coming and prepares them for his death, Peter declares, I will die with you. Making the denials all that much more painful. Sometimes we stun ourselves, don't we? Sometimes you and I find ourselves crossing a line we didn't think we would ever cross. Sometimes we have some type of, of line in the sand in our head or in our heart. I think, well, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I might do this, but I would never do that, usually in comparison with watching someone else. And then we find ourselves crossing a line of convictions that we didn't think we would ever find. And we find ourselves stunned. And sometimes, just like Peter, it's not just once we find ourselves crossing that line, but twice and three times we're stunned. You and I 
can be self-stunned in a sense by our own disobedience sometimes, right? We've, we've felt that disappointment. Probably inwardly, we'd like to think that we would never be in a situation that Peter is in. Well, we like to see ourselves standing by the fire and, and saying, yes, whatever it cost me, I was with Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. We, we love to see that in us, and that's a good thing for us. But the truth of the matter is that you and I have denied Jesus numerous times, haven't we? Uh, we deny him when we lie to someone. Uh, we, we deny Jesus when we, when we choose to, to somehow be unfaithful in the most important relationships in our lives. We deny him when we flirt innocently with someone at the office or through social media. We, we deny him when we allow something to raise up incredible anger with, within us or impatience. We deny who he is and what place he has in our lives. Folks, it's a tough day when we realize that we are not who we believed ourselves to be. So let's just say this. We're all there, right? But we realize, although we want to be different than Peter, we realize that we're all there and we've all denied him in some way. We have disobeyed. We have made some type of claim through actions or our words that Jesus really is not exactly who we believe him to be in our lives. Years ago, I was, I was at junior camp. And I walked into the dorm and there was a young man sitting in there. And for some reason, he was there, there by himself. And when I walked in, uh, there, there was this very, very potent smell. And as I walked in, uh, he looked up, and he, was, he had a bottle of Axe. And he was uh, basically giving himself a shower with this bottle of Axe. And I walked through the door of the dormitory, and all of a sudden he just kind of paused, and he looked at me and he said, hey, Mr. Steve, he said, you want some of this? The girls dig it. Let me, he was 11 years old. I don't know how much the girls dug axe. I can tell you that 11-year-olds at camp stink, and there is not enough axe in the world to cover the stink over that 11-year-old camper. We're there, right? And the truth is that, that we are all there. Not only 11-year-olds stink at camp, everybody stinks at camp. I mean, I would tell you that when I came home from junior camp after three or four days in the, in the, in the heat and uh, running around and, you know, doing all the things you're doing, I mean, when I got home, I just, I realized, hey, I stink. And one of the first things I would do is just go in the shower and take a very long, hot shower with lots of soap. Folks, we're all there. Sometimes there's just not enough acts to cover it up. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned, and all fall short of God's glorious standard. And that's the reality. I think it's important before we do a whole lot of finger pointing at Peter, who, who happens to be one of my favorite New Testament characters because I see myself in him so often, it's important before we point too long and too hard at Peter that we realize, hey, we are there, and then, as Roman says, we are all there. So here's my question before we go on. What are you going to do with the stink? What are you going to do with the stink? Uh, what are you going to do with that sin? 
What, what, are you, what are you doing with the sin in your life? What are you doing with, with the times that, that sin looks like denial in some way? Denying who Jesus is and the place that he has in your heart. What are you doing with that? Because the next step and what you and I choose to do once we understand that we all stink, that we all have sin, what we do next is very, very important. See, Matthew will record, Matthew will record this for us. That Judas, after betraying him, after betraying Jesus, takes his guilt, takes his sin into his own hands. And Matthew says he goes back to those that he betrayed Jesus to, those who gave him the money. And he says this, I have sinned. A recognition of his sin, a recognition of his wrongdoing. Sounds like he's on the right path. And they reply, what do we care? And then Judas took the money and he throws it down in the floor of the temple. And he goes out. He took his sin and his guilt in his own hands. And with those hands, he tied a knot and Judas hung himself. What you and I do after we become aware of the own stench in our lives, folks, is vitally important. Because see, the, the guilt of sin, not just the, the sin itself, but the guilt of sin does some incredible stuff. And sometimes, there, there, again, there's just not enough acts in the camp to cover that sin and that guilt that goes with it. See, the guilt of sin, folks, it, it destroys our confidence. It destroys our confidence. When, 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 we, when we take our own sin into our own hands and carry that guilt, our confidence in God is destroyed and what he is doing. We become fear-driven. We, we become fearful of being found out that others will find out that we are not who we claimed to be. We become fearful and fear-driven of being caught. And so we back as far away from other people as we possibly can. It's said that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes series, once took five prominent men in England and he wrote them all a message, and the message said this, all is found out, flee at once. Within 24 hours, all five men had taken off and left the country. A little humor to it. But the truth is, when you and I have secrets, when you and I are trying to live or living in fear because we are trying to cover up what we have done, Anything that looks like it may find us out causes us to retreat further and to run, right? We live with the dark cloud overhead. We live with the secret within our heart. And because of that, because of that, the guilt of sin not only destroys our confidence, but it just damages our relationships. It damages our relationships. Some of you have been as a result of crossing that line or that sin in your life, that denial. Some of you have been impatient with people that you should not be impatient with. You find yourselves edgy. Fear creates edginess. You find yourself lacking trust in relationships and distancing yourselves from people. Years ago, I was in a situation where I, I found myself owing a friend some money. And like a lot of things, didn't, didn't think about it for a while. And then it came up. And once it came up, it, it, it was there. It seemed like a lot all the time. And one of the things I realized that, that happened as a result of that was <clears throat> that even as I approached my friend, I could not look him in the eye. And I tried to make every conversation as quick <clears throat> as possible so I could get away from that situation. I could not look my friend in the eye. See, the guilt of sin will always damage our relationships. 
It takes our confidence from God, it damages our relationships, and it keeps you and I stuck in the past. It has this, there's this short chain that, that as we are trying to go forward in our life, as we're trying to make progress, as we're trying to grow in our faith or in our love for other people, that short chain keeps us tied firmly to the past. We're focused on the past. And through the, the cruel gift of replay, Whatever it was that we did plays itself out in our mind over and over again. And not only that replay, but also the projection of what will happen if we are found out. It keeps us stuck in the past. Folks, there is a wind reason. There is a reason that our windshield is bigger in our car than the rearview mirror. And God's, God desires his, his windshield for us to be larger than the rearview mirror. There's a place for a rearview mirror. There's a time for looking back. There's a time for evaluating and allowing God to evaluate. But at the point in time that when we have taken our guilt and our sin into our own hands and that rearview mirror begins to grow and the windshield of our future and what God has for us begins to diminish, things are out of order. The guilt of sin keeps us stuck in the past. And folks, simply this. That's the importance of accepting the forgiveness that Jesus offers. Now, not only, not only for the sin, but for the guilt, the guilt that the sin contains for our lives. Listen to what David said in Psalm 51 after his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. He sings this, blot out, Lord, the stain of my sins. Wash clean the guilt of my sin. Psalm 51. And folks, I, I want you to grasp, I want you to grasp this morning that my unwillingness and your unwillingness to believe the truth that Christ forgives my sin, it chokes my ability to enjoy the grace. It chokes my ability to enjoy, to, to enjoy the joy in the future God has for me. So we know we're in the camp. We know we're all there. There's a stench of sin just like Peter felt after those three denials. So what do we do? We find that Jesus, that, that Jesus had three specific face-to-face -face encounters with Peter. And I think as we look at that, we're going to realize there are some very vital lessons for you and I as we have found ourselves denying Jesus. Found ourselves with sin in our life that sometimes we may not know exactly what to do with. Luke records in Luke 22... At that moment, the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. And suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping. Now, I got to ask this question. Well, what's your response after you cross the line? Well, what's your response when you found yourself being dishonest, lying, putting some figure on your tax re return that you know is not true? Well, what is, what's your response when you find yourself defensive or when you find yourself impatient or when you find yourself caught up in lustful thoughts? Sometimes, sometimes we blame, don't we? Be, be easy in those situations to compare ourselves with someone else so at least we can feel relatively good about ourselves sometimes, right? And depending upon our personality, we have different responses. We justify it. We, we blame others. We use the ifs. If, if, if they wouldn't have done this, then I wouldn't have done this. We even deny it sometimes. 
Even as Peter did, I mean, caught, being it since Jesus kind of caught him right-handed. He knew that Jesus knew. <clears throat> Years ago, my wife Dawn worked in a preschool. She told me the story one day that she had watched a little preschooler actually do something wrong. I mean, she just stood and watched him. And she pulled him over and said, hey, uh, you should not do that. And he said, what? And she made clear what she had just observed him doing. And he said, she said, he looked at my eyes and said, I didn't do that. Where just moments before she had watched him in the act. And he continued to deny that he had ever done what she had observed him doing. And folks, you know, we can laugh about that. And preschoolers do it, but you and I know that there are times in our life, in our marriage, in our parenting, in our relationships, that we are caught red-handed and yet continue to deny what we've done, we have done. Of course, Jesus, Jesus sees everything and knows all things. Doesn't make any sense to deny. Peter's response, folks. Peter's response is tears. Not just tears, but Dr. Luke records, he wept bitterly. See, when we've crossed the line, and for whatever reason we come face to face with Jesus, I think what happens here with Peter is something that we need to learn. That in, the, that, that in those tears, in that bitter weeping, that, that Peter was beginning to own, and even, and even without words, he really didn't need to confess it because he knew Jesus had seen it, but there's an owning and confessing of his failures. That is important for us to learn. That we own and confess the things that we have done. That, that we have an admission, which is a painful admission, that we are not who we thought or believed ourselves to be. We face ourselves, and that's painful. <laughs> we face others who believe in us, and that's painful. And actually bringing ourselves into the presence of God and looking Jesus in the face is one of the most difficult things to say, to hear our mouth speak, I have sinned, and this is what I have done. But folks, I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you this morning that that, that face-to-face -face moment and the pain it brings is also an incredible preventer of it happening again when we own and confess, when we look into the eyes of Jesus and see the truth and grace, it is a preventer of us doing that again and it brings this incredible freedom to our lives. The chains begin to break. We move to John 21. It's days later the resurrection has happened after the crucifixion. Jesus has done this, this, this series of times when he's appeared. I mean, actually like through locked doors and the disciples are, are gathered and all of a sudden he just appears. I think it's actually kind of humorous, although I'm sure they were not humored at the time. I think they were scared to death. And sometime after that, maybe, we're not told a specific day, but, but sometime after that, Peter kind of wakes up one day, and maybe, maybe he, he's hungry, maybe he's just looking for something to get his mind off that all has happened, and he just, he just says this, hey, I'm going fishing. And some of the other apostles say, hey, we'll go fishing with you. And so they get in the boat, and they go out, and they're fishing. That's what fishermen do. And he says, I looked up on the beach, and Jesus is there at the beach. He is there on the beach, and they don't recognize him at first, but all of a sudden, when they finally do recognize him, what happens next is a, is a passage I want to tell you that, that, almost, that almost brings me to tears when I read it. Because Peter, who has crossed the line, Peter, who has denied Jesus three times, Peter, who we, we don't know, we, this is the first time we really have any, any kind of a... Um, an idea that there's been any face-to-face -face contact between he and Jesus at this time. It seems to be primarily in group situations. And when Peter sees Jesus on the beach, Peter does something that is absolutely mind-boggling to me. 
John says in 21 7, then the disciples that Jesus, the disciple that Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. He jumped into the water and he headed to shore. Folks, I'm going to tell you, that is heart moving. It is heart moving because it shows, it shows what Jesus who he is, and it shows that Peter recognized who Jesus was. He jumped out of the boat. And I want to tell you, folks, there is an acid test there. There is an acid test. What we do after the confession of our sin probably is more of a test of what you and I really believe about Jesus and who he is than maybe anything else. Peter knew what kind of God Jesus was. He knew what kind of friend he was. He knew what kind of savior he was. And he got out of the boat. He didn't just get out of the boat. He jumped out of the boat. And you can just see him just knees high, splashing through the water. I don't know what he he does when he gets there. I don't know if he hugged. I would certainly imagine he did not respect social distancing at that point in time. Maybe he gave Jesus a big old wet hug. Maybe he just stood back. Maybe he shook his hand. Maybe he put his hands on his shoulders. But I think he went eye to eye to Jesus because he knew, he knew there was something that needed to take place between he and Jesus. He ran to Jesus. And folks, I'm going to tell you, man, it is so easy for us. When we have sinned and even after confession, it is so easy for us to make excuses. It is so easy for us to find ways when there is sin between he and us or even after confession for us to somehow pull back from him because we just don't believe about him what Peter believed about him. That he would be a God who would demand the truth but who would give grace. Do you believe that about Jesus? Because if you don't, you will push back. If you don't, you will push back and you will find every possible way not to look Jesus in the face. You'll buy a camper so you can be gone on weekends. You'll up your children's ball schedule on weekends. You'll find something good to do so you don't have to look Jesus in the face. You'll busy yourself. You'll increase your work hours. You'll be good, but it'll all be for the purpose of you not having to look Jesus in the face. Peter knew who Jesus was. He knew what he could expect. He knew there was business to be done. He runs to Jesus. Folks, you got to get out of the boat. You got to get out of the boat. Run to Jesus. I told you in one of our first face-to-face sermons that In John 1, that Jesus explained in a way, he says that he came to this earth full of grace and truth. I told you it would would appear several times, and it has. And as we get ready to wrap up this, this book, although John does not mention it, there's this incredible, beautiful, powerful example of Jesus coming in truth and grace. He demands the truth from Peter, but he gives grace, and he will to you. He shows up, and as they all come to as they all come to the beach, he he makes breakfast. He actually gets some of the fish that they have caught, and he's just a tremendous fish fry or fish bake or whatever. And and it doesn't say exactly what happens, but you get the idea that there's this gathering there around the campfire, and they're they're all eating breakfast. And it says in John 21, 15, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, I think they're one-on-one. I think they're face-to-face the third face-to-face moment that we find that we encounter between Jesus and Peter after this denial. Maybe he pulls him off the side. Maybe, maybe he pours a cup of coffee at the campfire and then says, here, here, Peter, take this, and they take a stroll down the beach. I don't know what it looked like, but I think it was one-on-one. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you.
Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And a third time he asked Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt, it says, that Jesus asked a question the third time, and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. There are three denials, and there are three questions, because in some way, that the, the specificness of our sin has to be forgiven and has to be confessed specifically. Folks, see, Jesus knows. Jesus knows what we are carrying in our heart. He knows the guilt. He knows the, the sin and whether it has been confessed or not. And he knows whether we are trying to take it in our hands or whether we, like Peter, are looking for opportunities to go face to face to, to grasp the tr- grace and the truth of Jesus. And he calls a spade a spade. He is one specific. See, Jesus knows Jesus knows in this situation that trust has been broken by Peter's disobedience, by his denial. And he knows that you build trust not with words but with action. So he doesn't say just do you love me. He says do you love me? Yes, Peter declares. He says then feed my sheep. He calls him to action. Jesus knows that Peter is a word guy. I'm a word guy. I understand how easily words can come off my lips with with good intentions. Peter's a word guy. And it's another reason that I believe that Jesus calls him not just to declare his love for him, not to just declare that he is sorry, but he declares him to active love. You really love me? Yes, I do. Then go feed those who are important to me. Take care of them. And folks, the next time, the next time we see Peter, it is in Acts 2. And Peter's before some of the same men who actually put Christ to death on the cross. And so the situation, the, the, the opportunity for him to die or be hurt is much the same as it was before. But this time, this time after those encounters with Jesus, Peter's a different man. He has looked Jesus in the face, and this time he is ready. And what we find him saying is this, repent, repent. Turn from who you were and the direction you were going. And and Peter, folks, Peter has understood now clearly the need for repentance and the freedom that repentance brings. We find him having a boldness that he did not have before. Facing up to death, facing up to persecution, facing up to opposition, and standing firm, not perfect. No more denials. And I would just tell you this morning that 25 years later, when this man writes his letters to the churches, it's interesting what he writes about. He writes about Christ's precious blood more precious than gold or silver. He, he writes about loving others deeply because Jesus has called him to love the lambs, to take care of the lambs. He writes, love deeply. The man who has called him to be a shepherd, he refers to as the good and great shepherd. And Peter, the man who has turned from suffering earlier and denied his Savior, now talks with him about suffering and the hope that we have in the risen Savior. Folks, this morning, I just want you to know that God uses a man who failed miserably because Peter believed in and acted out of forgiveness. He chose to believe. He chose to believe that Peter or that God would forgive him. So here's the question. What does God know about you? What does God know about you? What does God know about the secret sin that you have? That you are living in fear because you don't want anyone to find out. You don't even want to admit it yourself. You don't want to admit you've crossed that line. What does God know about you? 
He knows the secret sin, and he also knows what he has for you, grace and truth. And he knows not only that, but he knows what is in your windshield. He knows what is ahead of you if you will come clean with him, if you'll come face to face with him. He has a future for you. He knows that future. If you will come face to face with him. And allow him to pull out that secret sin to allow him to convince you that his forgiveness is real and it's life-changing. Folks, no matter what failure, and in times like these that we are in creates a pressure and tension, but no matter what failure you have, his love is unfailing. And what he wants more than anything for you, for you and I, is just to Look us face and face, face to face, close up so he can look into your eyes, so you can see his truth and his unfailing love and his grace for you. And so that you can believe maybe for the first time, regardless of how many times you've read it in scripture, that you will believe that forgiveness is real and that you can walk in freedom as a result of that. Folks, that's John's challenge from the Lord for us this morning as we go face to face with the Savior.